Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics, a podcast dedicated to exploring how things get places and the people who get them there. We'll talk with logistics and supply chain leaders about innovation, industry trends, and the future of the logistics business. Now, here's your host, Joe Lynch. Hello, everybody. This is Joe Lynch from the Logistics of Logistics. Welcome to my podcast. We have a very special topic, a very special guest today. Not that they're not all special, but this is a little more special because it's my buddy, Joe Paris, from Europe. So today's topic, five challenges for expanding into Europe with Joe Paris. Welcome, Joe. Hey, it's good to be here, Joe. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, it's always nice to have two Joes in one place or one podcast. So I met Joe, God, I'm thinking five, seven years ago, maybe. Joe had a big group on LinkedIn, and he still does. And he has a huge LinkedIn presence. And I was always trying to build a big presence on LinkedIn. I finally think I've gotten there. I don't know if I've gotten to Joe's level, but we talked, I think, a few times here and there. And then not so long ago, I noticed Joe's got a podcast, and I listened to it. And I thought, oh, we got to get Joe on my podcast. So Welcome, Joe. Thank you so much for taking the time. Before we go any further, tell us a little bit about you and your company. Well, I'm easy to remember. I'm Paris from New York, living in Frankfurt. Nice. (laughs) To me, the biggest achievement of mankind has been the barcode, because before barcodes, wherever I was going internationally, the people would look at my tags on my bag, and my bags would be going to Paris, regardless of where I was going. (laughs) Right. Okay. But now with barcodes, they don't even look at the bag. It's all just automated right to the flight, and I've lost nary a bag since. So. I've been owning my own consultancy business since 1985, so it makes me uniquely unemployable. I've worked for myself, which, of course, we all know if you work for yourself, that's a misnomer. You work actually for everybody else. You get the leftovers. My primary vehicle, my oldest vehicle, is Zonatech. It's a consultancy firm, but I have a couple of other vehicles and platforms. If anybody would be interested, they can just go to josephparis.me forward slash card, and it would point you to pretty much everything that I do. I will make sure, Joe, in the show notes that I put your information on all your companies and all your platforms. I'm also self-employed, which I always say it just means my boss is an ass. I can't be fired, you know, but I can uh, get my pay cut. That happens yes, all the time. Yes, indeed. <laughs> indeed. So, Joe, today's topic is five challenges for expanding into Europe. And I think before we get into that, so tell everybody where you grew up. I know you just mentioned New York. How did you end up living in Frankfurt? And tell us a little bit about your path to living in Frankfurt and starting your own companies. I was born and raised in upstate New York, a town called Endicott, whose claim to fame is that it was the birthplace of IBM. IBM has since moved out of there, but everybody that worked in the valley, including my father, worked for IBM. And for the last 20 years or so, upstate New York has been in a downward spiral economically. And I married a woman from Poland some 25 years, well, now 32 years ago. But at the time we moved from upstate New York, it was about 25 years. And we knew that our sons were not going to find gainful employment in this area. So we started looking around and I needed a good airport. No matter where I move, I have to have a good airport. So we looked at Boston, we looked at Chicago, we looked at Delaware. We didn't want anything south of the Mason-Dixon line because we melt being Northerners. And I said, you know, like, why not Frankfurt? Because we've been coming here for years because she has family here. And it's like, yeah, well, why not Frankfurt? And we started looking for ways to eliminate Frankfurt. And ultimately, since we're here, we couldn't find any that were not insurmountable. So we've been here now almost 10 years. Very nice. Very nice. Are your boys still over there? Yep. My oldest son is working for Lufthansa Technic as an airline mechanic. The audience might find this interesting about airlines. Two things that are interesting. First off, every repair manual for every airplane on the face of the planet, except for the ones that come out of Russia. But Every European and every American-made, Brazilian-made or Canadian-made aircraft, the manuals are only in English. Oh, nice (laughs) for him. (laughs) Yeah, there's one authentic document because they want zero opportunity for an error in translation. The second thing that you might not realize and I thought was fascinating is that all the nuts and bolts are only in English standard, no metric, because the United States commanded the aviation industry until the advent of Airbus in what, the 1970s or something like that? So pretty much every airplane made in the world 
was made in the States. You know, Northrop Grumman, McDonnell Douglas, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, etc. And they didn't do metric. We did it metric in automotive. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, of course, of course. But we were the minority of the manufacturers at that time. So tell us a little bit about your career path. Well, my career path was pretty simple. I started in 1985. I was 22 years old or something like that. Where I lived, there was an economic downturn, so nobody would hire me. So like many consultants starting out, they started a consultancy because nobody could hire them. They couldn't find a job. So what'd you go to school for? Where'd you go to school? I went to Binghamton University and computer science at the time. I revisited that later on in industrial engineering about the 2000s as I got disenchanted with technology in general. <laughs> so you ended up starting your company a long time ago. Yeah, basically I started out of my parents' bedroom when I was 21 years old. I mean, quite literally, my father wouldn't let me have the garage, you know, however many companies start in the garage. I started in a bedroom in my parents' house. So what kind of consulting do you typically do? You know, what we started with was dramatically different than today. But if we were to talk about superpowers, we're an operations management and operations consultancy firm. So our superpower is going to be to help companies design and deploy their own OPEX CI program, Lean Six Sigma program, whatever you want to call it, to better their company performance. We also do expert training and consulting programs i.e. help companies devise and deploy their own training and education programs. And having a lot of international experience, we help companies move from the United States to someplace else and from someplace else to the United States. Nice. Well, that brings us to the topic. Sounds like you're uniquely qualified to discuss it since you are from upstate New York and you are in Germany, Europe. So today's topic, five challenges for expanding into Europe with Joe Paris. So Joe, we had a lot of discussion offline when we were prepping for this. And I thought it was interesting because a lot of companies are expanding into different places all the time. And I know when we talked about the differences between expanding into Europe and Latin America and Asia. And I was kind of taken aback when you started talking about some of the challenges. And I know there's probably a lot of good things about doing it, but we're going to talk a little bit about the challenges and hopefully you can add a little bit of guidance as we go. So what's the first challenge you talk about when somebody's expanding into Europe? Well, let's talk about first who might expand into Europe or you know, from Europe into the States. It's not going to be the Siemens of the world or the General Motors of the world or the GEs of the world. They have their own teams. You know what I mean? So what's on this podcast is not going to be probably for them because they already have people that do this. But there's a lot of mid-market people and small cap companies that want to take their wares or their offerings or their services from the States into Europe. So, you know, I'm going to speak mostly to that audience because I think that that would be the sweet spot for this conversation. Okay, so... You know, like every good-blooded American, the first thing that I think of is taxes. Okay. Yay. <laughs> okay, yay. All right. Now, you have to understand that in the United States, we have federal taxes, which is for everybody in the United States. And then you have state taxes, which is for the people that live in that state and, of course, local taxes. Well, in Europe, what you have to understand is that each of those countries has its own federal tax. OK, so when you come to Germany, if you were to land your business into Germany, but do business in the Netherlands or in France or in Poland, the chances are very, very great that you're going to have to file country taxes in each of those locales, plus have an understanding of their traditions, their exemptions, because there's no harmonization. Okay, the whole thing about the you, the, I guess the underlying theme in this entire podcast should be the you and European Union is largely fictitious. Okay. <laughs> that blows me away. That Hopefully you'll expand on that. <laughs> yeah. There's no tax harmonization whatsoever. Well, before you leave that topic, and I think this is kind of interesting also, is if you're expanding from the United States to Europe and you're looking at the market here in the U.S. is 327 million or something like that. And then Europe, there's some big countries, but not nearly as big as the United States. So you're more likely, if you let's just say you're from Ireland, you have 4 million people, you're going to expand into the rest of Europe. It's just the nature of the populations, right? So if you're in Europe, you're more likely to have to expand. 
Absolutely. Just like if I was from New York, I'd want to expand into Pennsylvania and the rest of the United States. If you're European, then you're going to want to expand into other European countries. Absolutely. Because you would have a limited marketplace. I'm not talking about like the local pizzeria, right? You know, we're talking about international multi-state businesses as the case might be. But tax harmonization is going to be a big challenge. Okay. So you're going to have to get somebody that knows the rules of the road, which are ever-changing on taxation in Europe. That could be a whole podcast in itself. And then you also have to worry about the United States, remember, taxes on worldwide income. In Germany, the only tax on the income you, you know, pretty much, the only tax on the income you make in Germany. Right, So you have that extra level of complexity to consider. Now, there are tax treaters where a tax that you pay in Germany will offset the tax you would have had to pay in the States. But again, it's a wicked problem, man. (laughs) Yeah, it sounds like it. So first big challenge is tax. What's the second big challenge you see over there? The second biggest challenge is HR. Okay, Workers' rights in Europe are not like in the States. We're, by and large, an at-will country. You know, we could hire very quickly and very freely, and we could release, I don't want to necessarily say fire, because there's a lot of ways people can separate, right, layoffs and what have you, but they can release people at will. In Europe, that's not the case. Most contracts, first off, every employee will have an employee contract, okay? Even if you're working the counter at a a fast food joint, you're going to have a contract. There's going to be a six-month probationary period during which... The employee is at will. You can get rid of that person for any reason whatsoever. However, six months in one day, things change. And it could get exponentially more painful to release somebody over time. And the severance packages that you're going to have to offer them are going to have to be included in your calculus for if you want to expand into Europe. Give us that example. You talked to me about an example of someone you were trying to hire. Philippe. And I was shocked. I think my audience will be surprised by the numbers you shared. Yeah. So I was first here in Europe and I want to hire this guy. He's a really talented guy and he's from Belgium and he's a professional, CI professional. When you say CI, you mean continuous improvement, right? Continuous improvement. Thank you. So he's a CI professional and having a coffee with him, we're talking about the terms of his being onboarded. He's smoking a cigarette with his like thumb and pointing finger with his palm up. And it's very irritating to watch. And uh, we're having a coffee and he starts talking about what he's entitled to when I fire him. Now, mind you, I have not even hired him yet. And he's telling me what I'm going to have to pay him when I release him. And he's going on and on and on. And he's like, you'll have to pay me 50,000 euros. And he takes a drag. And I look at him. And 50,000 euros is like, what, 60, 70 grand? Yeah, 65 right now. It fluctuates about a 10% premium. So I look at him. I say, Philippe, why would I pay you 50,000 euros to release you? When for 5,000 euros, I could have Boris from Belarus kill you, hide the body. They'd never find you. <laughs> And of course, Philippe was shocked. You're being an American now, yeah. Joe. And of course, I'm a New Yorker too. So, you know, so of course he looks at me shocked, almost as shocked as I was when he told me about 50,000 euros and pretty much there ended the interview and I didn't hire anybody in Europe ever since. Before we leave this challenge that you have with hiring and firing, more firing, is there the gig economy in Europe like we have with a lot of contractors? Because I know everyone I know uses Fiverr or some of those type of services that let you get services for a hundred bucks or 200 bucks for this or that. And those people could be anywhere in the world for all I know. Yeah. Well, depends on what country you're in, of course, because again, the country to country laws vary greatly. But for instance, Poland has amongst the highest number per capita of independent contractors in the world, because what they do is they form themselves as an independent contractor and they get hired to work the lines, you know, assembly line, warehouse, whatever it might be as an independent contractor. Okay. This gets them away from all the state and federal regulations there for employment. But in reality, they're punching in and punching out like somebody that's an employee would. Let's face it, for every regulation, there's going to be some guy that's smart enough to figure out a way around it, especially when they're just trying to put food on the table. So talk a little bit about the days off. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this is 
Okay, so you have to understand, I'm an American, okay, and I'm here in Germany, and trouble with this, I got to tell you, Joe, this is a real challenge. Like, today's a day off in Germany I'm working, okay? The challenge is, is that there's very few days off in Germany that are in the U.S., in the U.S. that are in Germany, or in Europe in general, okay? Which usually ends up meaning that I work everything except for Christmas and New Year's and Easter, because those seem to be universal, But if you're an employee in Europe, you're going to have a bunch of holidays. I mean, it varies by country and even by state within country, but you're going to have a bunch of holidays, probably at least twice as many as a normal person would consider a bank holiday in the States. Like everybody would get Columbus Day off, for instance, in the States, if Columbus Day were here. And that's discretionary back in the States. But in addition to the holidays, they get four weeks of vacation. Okay, four weeks. I'm jealous. Yeah, that's after that six month probationary period. All right. But you get four months. You don't have to work there 10 years to get the four weeks. I mean, you could just, you know, you work there to your probation, you get four weeks. If you get sick while you're on vacation, those count as sick days, not vacation days. Yikes, yikes. I'm jealous. I'm jealous. I told you my boss is an ass and I don't get many days off. Yeah. All right. I hear you. <laughs> so, Joe, the, so the first challenge, big challenge, tax. Second is hiring and firing HR, basically having employees. What's another big challenge you see over there? Another challenge is going to be investment and finance. They don't do the deals here in Europe like they do in the States. You're not going to have that many unicorns. If you do, the financing is probably going to come from a PE firm or a bank in the States. Their risk appetite is very, very low. And I guess I could understand because if you go bankrupt here, it could take seven years, not like 30 days, like General Motors in and out of bankruptcy in 30 days. It could be seven years. You could be prohibited from ever running a company again, and you could go to jail regardless of this whole corporate umbrella. Okay. And I'm not even talking about like fraud, like, you know, fraud in the States, you go to jail here, you go to jail. But if you're just stupid, if you make a dumb choice, that could land you in prison. I saw an interesting stat not so long ago. I was talking to an Israeli company. They're talking about venture capital. And they said the number one country in the world for venture capital still is the United States, venture capital's investment. And they said Israel's number two. And they said, by the way, Israel's number two ahead of Europe. Right. That doesn't surprise me. And I was like, wait, the whole co- the whole place? They say, yeah. And so there's a risk aversion there. And maybe it's just not set up the way we are as far as investment and finance yet. No, no. In fact, in German, the word for debt and the word for sin are the same. Not a bad plan. <laughs> so you don't have the same investment options for private equity or venture capital. No. So if I'm expanding into Europe, give me another challenge I might run into. Okay, so... Assuming that you know that there's going to be investment risk, okay, and finance risk, the next biggest risk is going to be ego, specifically the ego of the people that want to move from the state or expand from the states to Europe, okay? And when I say ego, oftentimes they want to build. They want to build that plant. They want to build that office building. They want to see their name on it, okay? That's the ego part. If it's your first foray into Europe, you're not expanding further into Europe, but this is your first foray into Europe, I would plan everything as being mobile and temporary, okay? Because you don't know what you don't know. And what you don't know can be a lot, and what you don't know can really hurt you. So say, for instance, you did use your good capital to build a facility here in Europe. You might not have built it near your customer. You might not know who your customer is. You might not know the rules and the regs and et cetera. And all of a sudden, you've sunk all this cash into the ground. And if something goes bad, it's impossible to get out. Right, Joe. What I've just thought about is you mentioned some of the challenges with tax, some of the challenges with hiring employees, managing employees. Now, if I am with the investment, I've just started thinking, add all those up, and now I'm in a... I insist upon building my own plant, and I get there, and I say, God, I didn't realize how expensive it was. I'm not profitable here. 
And how do I get out of it? <laughs> I've got all these employment contracts. I got taxes yeah. associated with it. And I've got this albatross around my neck. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I actually coached a company on this not too long ago. They made cleaning liquid. We'll just say that they made cleaning liquid. And they wanted to actually put a plant in here to make the cleaning liquid. Now, first off, it's liquid. It's a process industry. You're going to have environmental issues, blah, blah, blah. Who's going to navigate that? All right. And I finally said, listen, why do you want to build a plant? Why don't you just get a co-packer or co-blender or somebody that you could subcontract your formula out, you know, proprietary basis or under non-disclosure and IP protections and all that stuff. Europe does have very solid IP protections. I will say that as opposed to some places in, in the world. But I just coached him and coached him and coached him on why he should do this. Because expanding into Europe, and I know that I've been laying a lot of negative stuff and gotchas, they're only gotchas if you do the wrong thing. Okay, if you don't do the wrong thing, then there's no gotchas. All right. And the biggest gotcha is being stuck. Once you're stuck, you're stuck. Your choice is either to double down or pull out. All right. And my advice to this gentleman, this president of the company, was to just lease. See if your product is going to be a hit. Maybe it's going to find some chemical or chemical reaction or whatever that is going to make it prohibited from being here. So, for instance, Cinnabon used to be here. Okay, Cinnabon. I love Cinnabons. All right. Every time I go back to the States, I bring back a big 15 pack for my kids. I mean, they love it. Cinnabon used to be here. It's not anymore because it has too much cinnamon in it. That's the reason. Oh, my God. I okay. love Cinnabon. That's yeah, wrong. That is wrong. Okay. <laughs> Come on, you're up. <laughs> but, but think about this. I mean, you got this cleaning liquid, all right? And you go here and you want to make it and you want to sell it. But there's some chemical in there. There's some formulation. There's some packaging that makes it prohibitive. And by the way, in your packaging, if it's an electronics, then your instructions and your warranty cards and all that stuff have to be in like 20 different languages, all right? I'm probably exaggerating by one or two, but it's a lot of languages. Could you imagine how thick the books are that come with the cameras here? Yeah, they are that thick. Joe, and I think if you're coming from the U.S. and you're used to, we have four distribution centers, one out in California, one down south, one in the northeast, and one in the middle of the country. And they all kind of run the same, right? And you go, yeah, now I was funny, I expanded to Europe and I you know, went open to D.C. Yeah, you run right into those problems you're talking about, which is you're shipping to a lot of different countries, a lot of different requirements, and we just don't know. So I like what you're saying about keep it temporary, outsource partner. <laughs> yeah. Until you get your feet under you, until you discover what it is that you know. Okay. Once you know that your customers are there, they want your product, you're generating revenue, you know, hopefully some profits, things are on the upswing. You understand the lay of the land, then maybe think about putting in your own plan or your own office. But until then, let everybody else take the risk because these co-packers or these co-blenders or what have you, they have employees. They have employee contracts. They have employee benefits. They got the tax systems all set up. Now, basically, they're sending you a royalty check every month for whatever it is that they've produced and delivered. Yep. Just stick a toe in. Just stick a toe in. That's it. Okay. <laughs> so what's another challenge you see when people are expanding, companies are expanding into Europe? Well, if you're thinking about along these lines, environment is gigantically important here, much more so than the U.S. The Germans in particular, oh my gosh, they love their forest lands, okay? And this is not a knock on that. I mean, personally, I think it's stinking beautiful here, okay? I go around, the air is so clean. You know, the funny thing is a German won't appreciate that, but a guy from New York will, all right? But and when I say they don't appreciate it, they want it perfect. I agree. I spent a lot of time in a week or so in Austria and I a little time in Germany. And I remember thinking, boy, this is a beautiful country. And I really did love, and I do believe most Americans, most everyone in the world wants a cleaner planet. It's just what you're saying is maybe they're further along on that. Everybody wants it. Okay. But Germans and much of certainly Western Europe lives it. You know what I mean? This is something that they hold near and dear to their hearts. And it takes a priority in the everyday life of the average citizen, much more so than the everyday life of the average citizen in the United States. This is not a judgment thing I'm observing, all right? But the observation is going to impact your plans to expand. Be prepared, okay? Especially going on, maybe this is a stroke slash one on the build, lease, or outsource. But if you do try to build or want to build, 
be prepared for a litany of environmental hurdles that you will have to overcome. So, Joe, you talked about five challenges for companies expanding into Europe. One is, and this is your experience, is tax is a biggie. Number two is HR and labor, those labor contracts, a lot of time off, some of those challenges. And number three, you talk about investment and finance. Number four, you said keep it temporary. You don't know what you don't know. Don't make a huge investment. Outsource, lease, partner. Number five, environmental impacts are much more of a business concern there than in the U.S. I'd like to give a bonus if it's okay. Oh, that'd be perfect. Give us that bonus. Okay. The bonus is cultures and customs. Okay. If you're serious about moving into Europe, spend the time here. Okay. When I say spend the time, I don't mean come over here for a week vacation and see all the tourist spots. I mean, come here, take a look at the real Europe and your customers in particular, okay? Who are your customers? Know your customers. You know, in the continuous improvement world, they say voice of the customers. Seek that voice, listen to that voice. I can't emphasize that enough. And understand that the customs vary dramatically from country to country, but almost unimaginably between here and the States. You know, my wife is from Poland. We were coming here 20 years. We moved here. Guess what? There's a lot of difference between visiting family and moving here. So, Joe, I imagine this is common for you is that you're exposed to Americans, even though you might not be a full on German or European, you're always going to be American. I bet you cringe once a week when you see Americans wandering around doing stuff that might not be appropriate for Germany. Well, yeah, <laughs> but I'll tell you, like here, my son and I went out for a beer a couple of weeks ago down to this market square. And because of social distancing, we couldn't go inside. All right. So they gave us our beer and we sat in the square of the town. Right. They don't care about that. It's like they're a lot more open about a lot of things, but they guard their borders viciously. When I say guard their borders, I mean, you do not talk to a European after hours about work. That doesn't happen. They measure distance much more differently than we do. Like, I don't think twice about driving two hours for dinner. I'm sure, Joe, you've probably done something similar. Right, right. Here, when we first moved here, we had this house. We became friends with the people next door, and we moved five kilometers away. And as we we're leaving, they said, oh, geez, that's too bad you're moving. We'll never see you again. Well, it's like only five kilometers away, which is roughly three miles or so. You know what? They were right. We never saw them again. <laughs> Honest to God. So they're much more laid back. They're much more deliberate. Less impetuous, okay? You know, especially I'm going to measure myself as being a New Yorker. I'm fairly impetuous. In fact, I told my neighbor once when I first moved here, he says, how's the move going? I said to him, geez, I didn't think everything all the way through. And he shakes his head, typical American. That's like, (laughs) you know what? He's right. But at the same time, I'm here in Germany. If I had spent my time super analyzing, hyper analyzing every little thing, I would still be in upstate New York. So there is this thing about how much certainty can you possibly have? You're in continuous or familiar with continuous improvement, Joe. Oh, yeah. I'll ask you this question. How much data do you have to collect and analyze to absolutely guarantee an outcome beyond the shadow of a doubt? With a certainty. (laughs) I guess it depends, but I always think I'm a gut guy, so I don't like to go too far before I say this is the direction. I always use the term directionally correct. Okay, so I like that term. I'm like that too. Germans are not. No, I know. I worked with Germans quite a bit. I do have German customers. Yeah, and we're talking about culture and customs, right? Okay, so if we think about that, how we're impetuous, we don't think things all the way through, whereas Germans do. You think about the clashes that are potential there. And these are the things that we have to guard ourselves against when we come here. We're coming to their house. We can't tell them how to live and behave in their house. I've experienced some of this in the past. I worked inside of Chrysler. I wasn't an employee. I was a consultant or a contractor when they got bought by Mercedes or Daimler. And I remember the integration between the Germans and their product development process, which was very similar. I mean, there's obviously different languages, but that we merged the product development processes. And 
I thought there was two milestones that we all felt like there was more rigor in the German process. What was interesting, though, when we would have meetings at the milestones, you always have to go up to the top of the house to see the vice presidents and us, the COO, sometimes the CEO on the update. And the different attitudes about disclosing problems. So there was a chief engineer who would say, yeah, we spent way too much money on tooling and this went wrong and that went wrong. And if I had to do it again, I'd do this. And there was some on the American side where it's, oh, we got to fix the processes. But it was kind of interesting. There was others on the German side that initially, they again, they changed, said, well, that guy should be fired. <laughs> he just admitted that he screwed this all up. <laughs> and I do remember thinking it was a nice merger and it's done well. Well, it did well for a while. But it was very interesting to watch the differences between the people. Neither one was wrong. Neither one was right. What they did best was when they merged it. I often say to people that the superpower of an American company is the diversity in the company. Because we all learn how to problem solve when we grow up. A South African doesn't have the supply chains or the wherewithal to fix something properly. So they're going to fix everything that needs fixing. They're going to gravitate to their first response is going to be WD-40 duct tape and coat hanger wire, right? I mean, the quick fix that gets the damn thing up and running right now. That's how they've been conditioned. A German will engineer that same fix 10,000 years from now and archaeologists will find it and it'll still be working. And Americans don't think things all the way through. So can you imagine if you had all three of these people plus others around the table looking at a problem? All right. You know, think about the innovation that couldn't come from that as long as everybody had the opportunity to share their thoughts and opinions freely. Exactly. Exactly. So, Joe, we talked about these. Now you gave us a bonus. So now we have six challenges for expanding into Europe with Joe Paris. Why don't you summarize these, put a bow on this, and then we'll wrap up this podcast. Okay. So I know that I gave a lot of things for people to worry about. These are just things that you have to put in the checkbox, right? Do I have these things covered? Because if you don't, and there's several other items, of course, that could come back to bite you. I would say that if we were to talk about the most important things, first and foremost is understand who your customer is. Make sure that that customer exists, not anecdotally, but in actuality. Be mobile. And when you come here, get that beachhead, be mobile. Okay, don't do anything that's going to be permanent because if you have to cut your losses or you have to redirect, maybe one place is going to be more suitable than another. You have to be able to be mobile. You have to be able to be agile and get to know the people and the places because it'll make it a lot easier in the long term if you understand their history, where they came from, the people in and of themselves, not what you see on the news reports, but firsthand, firsthand, mano and mano, and enjoy yourself. I mean, it could be a lot of fun. It could be very challenging. It could be very exciting. If you like a challenge like me, I like a good challenge. So you give me a challenge and I find excitement in it, but also be prepared to have your nose bloodied a couple of times. So Joe, before we wrap this up, tell me what you like best about working in Europe. What I like best is the downtime. It's actually quite unplugged. I don't go for the glitz. Like I've never been to Las Vegas because it just doesn't interest me. Okay. I guess I'm a little bit more humble or a little bit more, you know, I have so much going on on a daily basis that when I'm done, I don't want to have more to go through. You know what I mean? I want to sit down near the river and have a beer, beer and a brat. And the simple things, I guess, is what I really enjoy. And walk through the wine country, just seeing the old stuff. I mean, in America, we say, oh, look at that house. That's 200 years old. We come here and it's like, you know, look at that thing. That was built before Christ walked the earth. (laughs) I love the history of Europe. I also, yeah, I think I'm sold. You said brat and beer and then wine country. I think I'm going to visit, Joe. You get that spare bedroom. (laughs) All right. Just let me know when you're coming, Joe. Love to have you. So, Joe, tell us a little bit about what you're doing over there. And first off, I should say this, and I think this goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, is 
If you're expanding to Europe, I think talking to someone like Joe and his team is perfect because they do have an American perspective. They understand the challenges we have as Americans and our attitudes, and they understand how to do business in Europe. So I think if you're going to do that expansion, talk to these guys. But Joe, why don't you tell us a little more about what you guys are doing? Well, most of our clients are larger multinationals, as you would come to expect. I mean, why would we talk about expansion internationally if it wasn't international clients mostly? But Basically, if I were to distill it down into the simplest things, we help organizations work better as organizations, not just vertical or process optimizations, but horizontal integrations. And ultimately, our philosophy is that we believe that time is the enemy of the 21st century company. Time. We have to compress time. So the competitive advantage is going to go to the company that could see further beyond the horizon. Okay. Recognize opportunities and threats sooner. Devise and deploy decisive responses faster and can rely on their organizations to be able to support their endeavors. So who's a typical client for you guys? Uh, A typical client. (laughs) We don't have a typical client. No, but they manufacturing companies? I would say that 80% of our clients make product. Probably the mix is 50-50 between process and discrete manufacturing. The other 20% are in the service sector, you know, finance, insurance, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's excellent. Joe, thank you so much. You wrote a book. Tell me about it real quick before we close. Uh, state of readiness. It goes to the mantra I just shared about time. It's been very, very well received, endorsed by some of the senior leaders at the most recognized companies in the world. In fact, the foreword was written by Andrew Lambert, the VP of production at SpaceX. I gave him a big kudos over the weekend. You know, was that awesome or what? By the way, we're talking on 6 1, June 1st, 2020, and we had the space. X launch on what Saturday? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was cool. A, it was awesome, man. So you worked with those guys. Yep, absolutely. So if you can take people to the moon, I think you can take them here. <laughs> There's the logistics of logistics. <laughs> <laughs> so. Expanding in Europe is nothing yeah, with Joe. Right, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'll take you to space. Joe, thank you so much for being on my podcast. It's good catching up with you. Yeah, likewise, Joe. Thanks for having me. And let's make sure we keep in each other's orbits there, so to speak. <laughs> yep. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast, your continued support. Very much appreciated. And until next time, Onward and Upward. You've been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage in conversations with experts in the logistics field. If you're an expert and would like to be featured on the Logistics of Logistics podcast, please email Joe Lynch at joe at the logisticsoflogistics.com.